First of all, Mobile Portland, please raise your hand. Wow, great group. Um, and, oh, there are a lot of empty seats over here if you guys want to grab some. Um, how many of you are from outside the Portland area in for OzCon, other reasons? Awesome. Thank you all for Portland. Coming to Portland, this is great. Um, we, meet, <laughs> we meet once a month uh, to talk about mobile. It's based on an international organization called Mobile Mondays. We normally meet on the fourth Monday of every month, but this month, because we had so many people coming in for OzCon, we moved it to Thursday so that we could get um, the great speakers that we got tonight. Um, and if you're interested and you want to follow the activities, um, if you're in the Portland area or even outside of the Portland area, we, we live stream the events thanks to Seth. We're recording them thanks to Michelle and Chris, and we post them online afterwards. Uh, MobilePortland.com is where all the video goes afterwards. Also, um, there's a Google group if you're in the Portland area where job postings get announced and things of that nature. Uh, I want to go through some upcoming events just briefly. Um, we have an Android user group that meets once a month um, on the second Monday of every month. Um, and you can follow them on the Google group. There's a Migo group that meets once a month. There's a um, Coco group that meets once a month. And they are the fourth Wednesday, I believe. Uh, and I need to put that up there. Um, and then we've got the Breaking Development Conference. If the topics that are covered here are the sorts of things that you're interested in, in terms of mobile web, uh, probably the best conference for that is Breaking Development, which is coming up in Nashville in September. And there's also a new conference that O'Reilly is putting on in October uh, down in San Francisco. Uh, for Android, Open Android Conference, and we've got a $200 off discount for people who are involved with Mobile Portland. Um, in the upcoming months, we're going to be covering mobile analytics next month. Um, in September, we're going to talk about nonprofits, NGOs that are using mobile devices, and in October, mobile advertising. What we try to do is we try to have one topic per quarter that is technical, this would qualify as a technical one. Um, we have one that's marketing, business, entrepreneurship, something of that nature, and then one that's social, some way in which mobile technology is changing uh, the way that we um, interact with the world. Let's take a moment to thank our sponsors. Um, Urban Airship is uh, the, like, they're our hosts. They provided the beer. They put um, uh, push notifications on all your devices that annoy you. Um, <laughs> So, but they're just amazing and awesome people, uh, and I don't think any of them are here at the moment, if that's the case, but they are inevitably hiring. Um, I'm not sure what they're hiring for, but I don't remember when they haven't been hiring. So if you're interested in, um, in working with them, uh, take a look at urbanairship.com. Um, we've also got Lynn from Azad, who has, thankfully, they've been paying for the chairs and the speakers and everything else, and so I was gonna turn it over to Lynn for a couple minutes. I don't know how I can compete with the beer, but I'll try. Uh, so, Ozod is a local technology consulting company. We've been in the area about 20 years. We're also looking for talented developers. Um, and we have a kind of a different model in that we hire our consultants directly to our company with benefits. And then the projects we work on typically are large organizations, long-term, multi-year projects. And for mobile development, we're not just looking for people who have Android or iOS development skills, but we'd love to see great Java developers, embedded Linux people, other skill sets that want to move in that direction for our team. So if you're interested, stop by, talk to me, or my buddy Will is back here. Um, you know, we'd love to meet a lot of people, even if it's not for immediate, just to get to know them. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you to, uh, actually I should, I should mention, um, I, I finally put our own logo up here because um, we, we help with the food and stuff, but we're also, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the fact that we're getting really close to doing a nonprofit organization, and um, we are helping fund the formation of that nonprofit. So um, I work for Cloud4, we do mobile web and other stuff, um, but that's not really important. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it's just, it, like, we do this because we love the community and we want to see Portland successful, so um, so that's why we're here. 
just briefly, uh, want to take a moment if people have job openings or announcements, and you, you're going to have like 10 seconds, 5, 15 seconds at most to like make your pitch. If anyone wants to raise their hand, Tim. Hi, Tim Shield, Xenophile. We are a Portland-based startup um, in the comic book space. We're looking for Ruby folks, Facebook app folks, uh, Tim at xenophile.com. Okay. Hey, my name is Thomas. I work for Wikipedia, a site that the majority of you have probably used before. If you like open source technologies, Wikipedia is a free open source of information and want to work with us on mobile, come talk with me. Okay. I'm Clara from Night and Day Studios. We're currently okay. hiring. Sorry. Yeah. Clara from Night and Day Studios, and we're currently hiring an iOS and um, Android developer. iOS and Android, Night Day. Hi, uh, I'm Tom. I work for Joint in San Francisco. Uh, we have Node.js, one of our big projects. If you want to work on that, we're hiring people. All right, and he's going to let you work here, right? You're not going to sure. Of course. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I should speak up. I'm uh, working for a startup in. Calgary, Canada, in uh, the, the telecom space. So uh, what we do is we're, we're uh, crowdsourcing cell phone usage data and we're running analytics on it to selling providers. So we're looking for more Node.js developers, so that's what my area is, and also Blackberry, Android, and iOS. I'm Rob, I work at Ziva Design. Portland here. We're looking for senior developers, what we call kinetic designers. Uh, if you can prototype apps of any sort, and also senior interaction designers. Any other job sort of announcements? No? I'm going to have Rennie come up and uh, talk just briefly about uh, IPDX, and I believe that there's some mobile related or some announcements related. Not close. Close? Okay. Chance. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, just wanted to remind folks that we've got the incubator going over um, about three blocks away. Um, we consider ourselves very fortunate to have been blessed with the presence of several local folks here, uh, Urban, PHP, and a couple other gangs. Uh, application window is open right now. Uh, we have, as participating brands in the space, Coke and Target, and we are really, really close to being able to share a third partner who we're damn excited about, um, and we hope that you guys will be too. Um, and uh, just one additional note, which is we've got some great mentors, um, but we would like to reach out if anybody would like to be a mentor for that program uh, and would like to throw your hat in the ring. Just drop a note to Rick uh, Tarazi, that's Rick at PyPDX.com, and let him know. Thank you. Thanks, Rennie. Um, uh, so apparently the announcement didn't quite make the cut. It was like it was. It might actually have made it tonight, but not. Yes. Oh. Okay. Um, so I want to give an update on something that those of you who are in town have heard about. Those of you who are from out of town don't know. Um, probably don't know about. We're in the process of creating a, a community device testing lab. Um, this. I thought for a second there was like a humming going on. Um, this building here, the glass room, is going to actually be the place for that device testing lab. So we're going to go to the carriers, the handset makers, OS vendors, and ask them to help sponsor a place that people in the community will be able to come when they're building applications or working on services, and they need to be able to test those on a variety of devices. Um, as far as I know, nothing like this exists in the United States. So we're going to be the first community to do it, um, and to do it as a, as a non-profit organization. Um, we've been talking about it for a while, but we've been making quite a bit of progress in the last month. Um, the first thing we've done is we've retained Miller Nash as, the, uh, as our legal counsel for the creation of the non-profit organization. And uh, Will in the back, are you hand up Will? Will is going to help us with this. Um, we're, we're forming as an Oregon nonprofit, not um, a 501c3 or a 501c6. And for those who have been following along, uh, I thought that that's what we could do, which is why we have a lawyer, um, which is great. Uh, we've got the corporation documents, which are pretty much ready to be filed. We've got three of the seven board members sort of set, and we're going to go seeking 
people who are um, you know, pretty well placed within their larger organizations or have connections that can help us bring in the funding to actually pull this off. Um, and we're going to be doing updates and details on localportland.com. I wrote a pretty lengthy update today about where we are in the process of what we're working on. Um, and I know a lot of you have been interested in it and interested in helping out and wanted to give an update on where we are in that regard. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to just point out um, before I bring and introduce our first speaker. Uh, there's a great number of tremendous people in town at this meeting who have a lot of knowledge related to this and we couldn't bring them all on stage. So Maximilian is from Argentina, um, wrote a great book on mobile web. Um, we've got a bunch of the Natobi folks here. Tom is writing the book on Node.js. Um, let's see, where did uh, uh, Andrea go? Where are you at? There, Andrea Chisati was one of the original people doing Warful and um, has been staying in our office for the week and uh, just phenomenal works for Nokia now. Um, and just a great, great group of people in, in the building, so take the time to talk to them because um, it's not very often we get them all here. So we've got a fantastic lineup tonight. Um, we're gonna start off with David Canada, and then we've got Patrick um, showing off uh, Winery and Brian LaRue um, making a repeat uh, profane performance. Um, <laughs> more of that later. Um, but uh, let's let's. Uh, I'm gonna introduce David while he gets set up. So. Um, go ahead. Um, oh, you. Uh, so David is the creative director for Essential Touch. Uh, before he started, or before he started at Essential Touch, he was the creator of the JQ Touch library, which a lot of people have used to build really successful um, mobile web applications. Um, I remember talking to somebody about working with Sencha, and they said that essentially the best thing about working with Sencha is that you get David as your designer, and you really can't go wrong with that. Um, the other thing is, is that we share an affinity for Raphael Sadiq, um, and uh, if I could have planned it, I would have had him march into that music. How many people know Raphael Sadiq? Awesome. Yeah. So good. All right, so please join me in welcoming David. Good day, David. Uh, I work at Sunshine. 
We're about halfway through the slide deck now. <laughs> so we're going to talk charts today. Uh, how many people know Ascension Touch? Framework, JavaScript framework? All right, that's most of you. Awesome. What do you guys think? Let's click the like, uproarious cheer. Yeah. God damn. Um, all right. So as you can see, I'm very prepared. So basically, uh, we have Ascension Touch. It's a JavaScript framework for building rich web apps for mobile devices. They work cross-platform, they, they work on iOS, Android, Blackberry, and they feel rich, they feel like native apps. Uh, so just last week, we released a charting extension for Ascension Touch um, that we're going to look at today. And I'm going to open the real presentation, which is a text file. <laughs> Okay, so we covered number one. So I guess the big difference between something like this and something like high charts, if you've seen something like that, or uh, some of the other packages out there, is that these are sort of optimized and built specifically for touch input, sort of out of the game. So first off, that means, uh, maybe you guys are developers real quick. Okay, we're, so we're like a tech-centered crowd. I can say the word canvas, and you guys don't think I mean like an artist. Uh, so they're all built on Canvas, uh, which means they work everywhere. Uh, Android doesn't have SVG support, so Canvas was pretty important. Um, it's also hardware accelerated in a lot of places now. So here's some charting examples. So can you guys see that okay? I have an iPad here. They look awesome on the iPad. Um, come find me afterwards, and I'll give you a little demo. But basically, we can do things you know, with touch that we weren't able to do before, just on the desktop. We can do things like saying if we swipe across a row, change it from being a bar chart to a stack chart. We could say if you tap and hold down on one of the items in the legend, you can actually drop it into another one to combine the data. Right? And then, of course, all the like multi-gesture support that you would expect. And you can pan. And so normally, actually, this happens, you can pinch to zoom, and then you can actually pan around with one finger. For the desktop, we have this sort of like hackish button in the top right that sort of takes care of it. So, whoop, not that one. Yeah, so we have things like rotation, uh, you can select, pieces and then use gestures to expand the selection. Uh, if we come back and look at this one, uh, you can actually compare two points just by tapping on them. That's kind of hard to see, I know, but find me afterwards. They're really awesome. They're better than this. Um, so then I'm just going to show you all a bunch of charts now. Uh, we have scattered charts which is the one with all the dots. And you can use like plus signs and crosses and all that stuff. Uh, radar charts, which we just recently made it so that you can actually rotate those guys as well. I don't know if you can combine these. No, not yet. Soon. Line charts. And look at the animations. They're like really sick, right? Super smooth. What's that? Speak up, you can't be embarrassed now. Um, yeah. Get the gauge chart, which is kind of fun. And so they all ship with animations by default. You can change the easing however you want. You can customize the animations. All the interactions that I've been showing, you can actually customize. You could say, for example, here, we have it so that if you tap and hold, not here, sorry, here, if you tap and hold, you get like a little info card. But you could easily say that only comes up on double tap. You could say that comes up on a swipe. Um, and all that happens with just a few lines of code. So I guess since you are all developers, let's look at code. I'm not really going to go into this per se, but. Uh, you guys can see it's very simple, right? Who knows JavaScript? All right, so it's like it's 
basic JSON format. We're specifying uh, a data store, which is a sort of sense of touch philosophy that you know just holds all your records together. Uh, that data store could be loaded over a server. You could be pulling the data for these charts from the Twitter API. You could be pulling from your own server, or you could just have some static XML file on your server. Um, but then basically we just tell it what's the title, what, what is the what are the axes going to be, uh, what type of interactions do we want to use, and that's pretty much it. The cost is undisclosed yet, but the uh, the running idea is a hundred dollars add on per such a touch. Can I keep the data? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they all animate um, sort of as they update whenever the data store is updated. The chart automatically updates, and you can specify whether that's animated or not, using all that stuff. The, as a designer, the coolest part of these charts, does anybody know SAS, SCSS, that kind of thing? Uh, so we actually built our own preprocessor, uh, CSS preprocessor, uh, built on the SAS syntax. So that you can actually style all of the pieces of the chart in what looks like CSS. And this is really hard to see, I call it. Um, but essentially, if we wanted to, you guys can't read that, but uh, if I change the colors attribute on the chart element, uh, you switch to a white background. There's an invert. Yeah, that's a good idea. So this is what we had before. We have some variables. So basically, if you've never used SAS or Compass, they let you bring variables and functions or mixins into your CSS. Um, so you can see by default, we are using uh, some variables called chart blue, default alpha, uh, chart green, chart red, etc. If I change all those to only use another variable we have laying around called base color, uh, I can say, the series, basically, I'm just lightening it a little bit every time, or actually darkening it. So I'm lightening it 30%, then 20%, then 10%, right? And if I do that, and then I do have to uh, build things. And let's go into the combo example. Right, you can see all of the uh, series are now based off of those colors. Right? Super easy. And it's CSS, so if, if, if you have a designer laying around, they can use it. They don't have to have, like, write in JavaScript. Um, taking that a bit further, so we actually use the exact same system in Sensual Touch and let you customize the entire output, the entire display of our application framework uh, with this CSS system. So if we actually merge the two together, I have some random variable file that, that's actually feeding the CSS and the chart uh, CSS. Uh, and let's just say we're making our base color green. And the build thing. Then we can come back and literally the entire application is now green. Granted, you probably don't want an entirely green application, but it's pretty cool. Um, it affects the charts, it affects the labels, uh, the tabs underneath. You can tell this one has a hard program color in it. Shh, <coughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Yeah, so if we take that like a step further, I guess I'll just show the energy which is sort of where I went as crazy as I could. How am I doing on time, by the way? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't just taking a photo of you. <laughs> you got like five minutes left. OK, cool, OK. Um, so we'll come out of this, we'll go into our energy demo. And this one, of course, is going to be impossible to see because it's black. But, um, 
you know, so this this demo we threw together just aggregates all the energy consumption and production across all the states throughout the country. Uh, I forget what API we're using. Um, but you can see this is sort of like an iPad type layout that's showing right now in the landscape. Um, oh yeah, that's impossible to see. Damn. They're so sexy right here. Just, just love. <laughs> I'm really only going for like the front two rows. j.mp slash touch dash charts. Yeah, what the hell? <laughs> uh, 
which might feel more native to some other developers. So I hope that answers. All right, and I forgot to say in the beginning. Thanks to Jason. Thanks to Urban Airship. The space is like really rad. Um, and thanks for having me. All right, so while we're doing the change-up, um, just a bit of fair warning, uh, we're going to try the lab mic again. I know, I'm sorry. But uh, Patrick has a lot of stuff that he wants to be able to type while he's doing it, and, and doing that um, with one hand is a little difficult. So, um, Patrick Mueller is, uh, works for IBM, is a WebKit contributor, uh, but perhaps more importantly, especially for our purposes, he has done something that I find particularly magical, uh, and I don't, I don't want to quite ruin that experience for you if you haven't seen it. Um, but I feel, I felt the same way about this, the way that I felt the first time that I was able to print to a printer that was in another room over a wireless network, and and still feel that way about that. Um, and so. Uh,
iOS simulator. So let's do this so we can go to my demo here. And we're going to see that turn green. Kind of hard to see that green, but um, sort of popped up and turned green. That meant it's now connected. So now I have my my um, my target demo target running in, in the simulator. So now connected to the debugger. So I can click on elements and just like in the real web inspector, I can see the elements as I mouse over. Yeah, you can kind of see that. Uh, the, there's highlighting over the elements, which show you the uh, border padding, padding margins, etc. Uh, then you can do some amount of stuff like edit text inside, and that'll get updated. You can delete an element, and there's other stuff you can do with elements, um, properties, and whatnot. The CSS stuff is, is pretty useful. Um, so if you click on an element, it'll show you all the CSS uh, rules that match. So in this case, we see I have a uh, color defined for all H1s that's overridden by this one because it has a blue class on it. I can disable that temporarily and it'll show it as green. Um, and then you can edit these as well. So I can change this to uh, black. Maybe you can't even uh, change, but it looks like it changed. Here. Um, so we'll go ahead and set that back to blue. Um, you can see all of the styles that are in place for this sort of all in place. And then see even all of them that are defaulted. And it's kind of scary that every element has these CSS properties. Um, normally you would never see that, but sometimes this uh, computed styles is pretty useful. Some other stuff we can do on this page, uh, we can actually see the rectangles for the border padding and margin um, in the usual web inspector view. You can see properties of the DOM element. Unfortunately, the classes are not displayed uh, properly. It's a bug. Somebody should write a bug against this product. Uh, but, but you can see all of the uh, attributes essentially that. Uh, sorry, property available on the JavaScript DOM element for that guy. And you can change those and, and stuff too. Um, I think that's it for the elements page. Um, so this is, if anybody's used Winery before, this is the latest release. And, and I've, I've gotten rid of some of the stuff that we didn't support at all before and added native to support. So we now support the web SQL stuff. This particular app, just does a few things by clicking the start button. Let me click it a few times here. You can't really see it doing anything on the, on the app, but it actually did some things here. One thing it did was create a database that wasn't there before, and that just magically appeared as soon as the database kind of opened. It also populated some stuff in this clicks database. So when you click on the database, you get a table dump um, of all the rows and columns. If you click on the database itself, you get a SQL uh, a REPL well, a prompt to, to execute stuff. So I can say uh, select date from clicks, and that will just show me the date column from the clicks table. I don't think you can edit any of this stuff, but there is a guy in the room who's using this. He's probably the expert on it now. Who, who was that? Expert. Yeah, there's the, there's the SQL library <laughs> expert you now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Why I didn't just read yeah. So, um, <laughs> then we also have uh, local storage and session storage support. So, if I click on the start again, we'll see that some uh, values being updated. Uh, these are editable, so you can um, just replace those. Uh, let's see what else we got. Okay, so then there's a timeline. Not many people use this, it's not clear how useful it is, but it's kind of cool. So if I uh, stop it again. To use this events timeline, you have to turn it on with the report button. It's down at the bottom there, it will go red. And once you start doing interesting things, they'll get logged in, in this event view. I'm going to stop it. So we can 
actually play with it a little bit. You can do things like zoom in on a certain time. And then some of these events actually have sort of multiple things associated with them. So here's a timer, when the timer was created, and then when it fired. We get some uh, XHR events as well, when the XHR was started and when, the, uh, when it was completed. There's also user events, so you can uh, add a console. Today it's called console.mark timeline, just like console log, but this is dot mark timeline. When you do that, the event will appear in the, the uh, in the event view, and you skip the string today. So that's the event view. And then finally we have the console. And the console is showing you your console.log sort of information. And it also has the um, the live uh, prompt here, so my typical Samples to reset the body background. So I'm just going to type back in the body style background. That's not right. Let's try. It's a background color. There we go. And it's not set essentially, so I'm going to set it to uh, green. And we see it change there and then I can reset it to what it was before which was nothing. Um, I think that's it for a demo in terms of the functionality. So anybody have any questions about sort of running the demo while I have the demo on? Okay, so um, <laughs> yeah, oh. it's, by the way it's pronounced winery. <laughs> No matter what, uh, <laughs> Toby really can tell you. <laughs> right, folks? I, I know you resent me for Did you have a question? I did. Ah. About a boot a a console. <laughs> it, 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 just a second. Uh, you said it logs console log type stuff. Yeah. What do you mean by that? There, there's a object in JavaScript called console that has a number of methods on it. Most people just use console.log. And so if you type console.log, give it a string, and then write it somewhere. If you're connected with Winery, you'll see it on here. Or you know, web inspector, you'll see it in the, in the console. Um, there, actually, console has a boatload of methods. There's like info, warning, error, and they show some of the different icons. You can do some filtering up here. There's some filters so you can see errors, warnings, and logs. Um, and then there's crazy stuff like the time, the timeline, and or maybe even more stuff. You can. Um, one of the things I recently fixed also is that you can give it an object. I wasn't doing this correctly before, um, but you can say console log give it an object, and it will um, display the um, objects properties for your giving an objects uh, view. These are all uh, sort of infinitely expandable over that. It's a pretty big one. Sometimes it's slow, and that's because there's a lot of data going over, over the wire. Um, but there's a nice that's huge, and one, the other one doesn't work. Um, that's the same, actually, it's just saying window, you can just type window, and you'll see the exact same thing. So uh, there's some, uh, one of the links in the presentation, actually like second or third page, is a link to Google's Chrome Dev Tools documentation, which is uh, really the only documentation on Web Inspector itself. So very, very useful because there's all kinds of crazy stuff in here um, that uh, nobody knows about. Quick question over here that I think that maybe other people might actually take just a moment. Yeah, Yuri, actually, for me, for the sake of sharing the rest of the class, I guess. Uh, No. Is it, so it could work with any or yeah. Yeah. Do they have to be wired? Wired? Yeah. Like USB. Do you have to be used to Google wired? You need to have um, okay, so the part I have shown here is actually three running things when you're using wired. There's there's the this is what I call the debug client. So it's running in your laptop. You have your debug target, which is presumably your device. And then there's a third piece, which is the debug server. So 
and this is an HTTP server which I provide. That's actually the problem. It's a project. It's just a web server. That web server has to be accessible by the mobile device and by the clients. So, for instance, if you're on your own uh, work network um, and you're trying to access um, and you're not on the Wi-Fi on your device, you're just on the regular phone network, you probably won't be able to connect, right? So you need to have network connectivity, essentially, between all those devices, but that's the only thing. Is there a your Ah, well, so we can uh, I'll talk about that. I ship, again, the project basically is a jar. That's the, the uh, thing that I ship. It's a the servers that's committed to Java, so all of the stuff that uh, this thing uses is in that jar. Uh, Toby has a um, website called debug.fungap.com, which is essentially the server as well. So if you don't mind uh, sending all this data over that internet thing, um, you can use that, and you don't have to run a server at all. Running the server is the hardest part uh, of this whole thing. Uh, are you talking about No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm willing to talk about it later, but it's, yeah, it's, okay. it's not a good story today. Right. I'm probably going to be something. Yeah. So, what do you have to install on the device? Do you have a JavaScript that you can install on the web page? So, the debug target, so the thing I'm debugging. Yeah, the phone. Yeah. So, on the phone, I can't do a view source, unfortunately. And actually, I should. Well, let me answer your question. You can do a view source. You can. What? Oh, duh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a view source. I, I, I actually, a lot of times when I'm doing a view source, I bring this up. I'm like, no, no, actually, I wanted a view source, right? Uh, but, but you're right, I can see the exactly the source here. Um, oh, this is a bad one, though, because the demo that I run that's shipped with the server does things a little differently. So I can't show this one. There's a, there's a uh, you need to add a script source element to, to the web page you want to debug, and the, the value of that um, source attribute is a um, URL that points to the server, and it's sort of a fixed name that you'll have to um, provide the server address. That's, that, that is the hardest part, is getting that server address in. The presentation talks about some tips on how to uh, find that name, which is something that everybody runs into. Yeah? So we're on non-based browsers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it comes up all the time. Uh, the answer, I believe, is no. Um, so it came up at OSCOM and, and some guy tested it for me and found out that there, I think he said half of it worked. Like some, some things worked and some didn't. So there's a bug report and uh, we just need to figure out what I'm doing that's budget specific. Um, the code running in the target is mostly mine, but some of it actually comes from Web Inspector itself. And that's hard for me to change, although I'm I packed around it a little bit, um, so may or may not be easy to do, but it is possible. One, one last question. Yeah. So I guess it's a download that's related. Does it work inside of a UI web view? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Good. All right. Thank you very much.
David is an amazing designer. Uh, Patrick is some kind of crazy ninja from beyond. I don't understand everything that either of them do, but we love their work. So it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be back. I love Portland. Uh, beer is my favorite thing. Portland's good for that. So usually I have really funny pictures that you can see and you'll laugh at, but you can't even really see that, so it doesn't matter. You can download the slide later. It doesn't matter. It's my Twitter handle. No big deal. Uh, it's a funny kid laughing at This is like the fair warning slide. Um, sometimes I might use language that's not necessarily appropriate. Sorry for that apology. You can get the fuck out. <laughs> Shout out to Dave who said he would do this, and Dave's like, no, you do it. <laughs> so that's Dave right there. Dave went on a vacation last year to India for a while. He gave us at least a week's notice, and so I photoshopped this picture of him with, I think, Shiva. <laughs> Anyways, whatever. The picture's funny, and I wanted to use it. So, have you guys heard of this thing called Home Gap before? Sorry, I'm going, to, I'm going to cover some basics first so that you get uh, a bit about what we're about, how we work, um, so that you can understand the rest of it. Uh, PhoneGap, essentially, the idea is you build native applications using web technology. And these things have been pitted against each other by morons, and they're not exactly the opposite. They're actually, they embrace each other. Uh, if you think about it, the browser is native, right? It's true, it is. And the idea, what we're going for here is device agnostic development. The web got this one right a long time ago. We want to build uh, our applications and we want to hit as many places as possible, and that's what the web is all about. Web technology figured this stuff out a long time ago. Uh, we recommend that at Nitobi, and we started working on this problem a while ago, um, taking a browser, Chromeless, and giving it access to native device APIs. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So today, PhoneGap covers, and I think the last time I talked to Portland, it was like three platforms. And so now we're on six in Anchor. Um, and we're working currently on adding support for Mego, which is an operating system you may have never heard of yet. They're here, right here, there's a user group here for it, so that's cool. Uh, <laughs> I, actually, I actually have a Mego device, so if you want to check out Mego, it is, it is brilliant. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on it. So does Andreas. Yep. So they're cool devices. If you get a chance, grab me or grab Andreas and check it out. Uh, this is something we're adding support for very soon in PhoneGap. And um, have you guys heard of this company called Microsoft? Wow. Remember them? Like, like, like a long time ago, they did that stuff. DOS and things. Anyways, they got a phone. It's all right. And uh, we're targeting that too. Uh, we're expecting to have support for Windows 27 sometime in the fall. So, this is a big advantage of PhoneGap. Uh, you offer your application and you get to debug it on all these platforms. So, it, it's super easy. Um, you need roughly 20 gigabytes of space to install all the SDKs that you need to develop for all these platforms. Uh, you need to have two operating systems, so you probably want to virtualize one of them. Um, you have to buy at least six phones. And then you have to master six different platforms. And so this doesn't sound like much of a selling point, and it's true it isn't. This is just the reality as a mobile software developer, you've probably already dealt with this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and actually, most developers are like, that sounds fucking impossible. But are you going to buy me the phone? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay, so we recognize this problem really early on. In uh, it became obvious to us uh, that installing six sets of SDKs in different operating systems is not necessarily possible. Um, we took PhoneGap, and I always say this, so forgive me if you've heard it before, I hate myself for saying it too, but we put PhoneGap in the cloud. And <laughs> it's a platform as a service. So you send us your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and we compile it. Hey, look, it's Remy Sharp. <laughs> yeah! I love that guy. <laughs> um, so, PhoneGap build 
is what I'm here to talk about, but I'll also talk about PhoneGap uh, itself. Um, the idea of a PhoneGap build is that you send us your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. We'll take care of the bullshit of compiling it, and we'll give you the flag. Um, everyone's like, what's the catch? We'll get into that. What's the catch? We'll get into that. Um, there's other aspects to PhoneGap. Uh, PhoneGap itself is based on a plugin like architecture, and so if, there, if there's anyone that's like, oh, it's just web tech, they're right, it's just web tech, but all that web tech can access any part of your phone at any time. And that's what PhoneGap plugins are about. I'll talk about that a little bit more. JavaScript libraries, we remain agnostic, if not an atheist, to the whole situation of JavaScript. Um, you can use any JavaScript library you want with PhoneGap. And you can use any IDE. Uh, a lot of different developers have different biases on what they like to do and how they like to work. The only thing we all have in common is that everybody else is wrong. <laughs> Right? Some people like Eclipse, some people like Visual Studio, some assholes like Vim, other ones like TextMate. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're all writing text. Um, so, some of the key aspects of PhoneGap, and people will say, oh, what about um, your competition? And I'll say, that's interesting. I didn't think we had any. <laughs> and I don't. Um, because I measure them on different things and they measure themselves. So, we run on six platforms. Anyone else who says they're cross platform doesn't. Uh, we have a huge community, lots of contributors. Um, you can leverage your code that you've built with PhoneGap for a mobile web app, uh, which you can't do with other platforms. And we support any framework that you want to use. So the way you work is perfectly fine. Standards. We got them. Um, whatever. We inherit them. Uh, so we work uh, with the browser instance that ships on the phone. Uh, a lot of the times this means WebKit, this doesn't mean WebKit is the mobile web that for the time being it looks like it is. Um, and we inherit the benefits of being on top of the WebKit project, that means HTML5. There's other standards in the W3C that are not in WebKit yet. Uh, and we're working and advocating to make those happen. And they're all around the device APIs. There's a group at the W3C right now called the Device API Working Group. Uh, we're working with them to see the APIs that you get in PhoneGap and end up with the browser, and it's working. Uh, right now, it, in Android 3, for example, there's the Media Capture API, and this is a pretty big deal. Uh, it allows you to access any of the media elements of your phone, so the ability to record audio, take pictures, video. Uh, Flash has had this for a really long time. It's finally being ratified into the standard and finding its way to the browser. You can do it today in PhoneGap, which is really cool. And the, the point of that, ultimately, is that these APIs uh, are coming to the browser. And this is the big revelation. It's not necessarily about phone gap, it's about the evolution of the web. And so the direction that we're moving our project, it's a prototype implementation of the browser that you'll be using in the next few years. And so if you want to play with this stuff now, it's an opportunity to do it. I could list these off and talk about them, but it's pretty obvious what they all do. Oh. Uh, so the plugin architecture is a big deal. Uh, nice plug for Urban Airship. Thanks for having us here, guys. Um, push notifications is one of the things people ask us about all the time. Yes, PhoneGap is capable of doing it. Uh, it's done with the plugin, and you can do it really easily with uh, Urban Airship. Our other big uh, plugin, which is probably a part of the platform, is called the Child Browser. Uh, do, has anyone here done any OAuth? Two-step OAuth type business? People begrudgingly raise their hands because they're all crippled and typing too much. Um, so the child browser plugin gives you this capability. Um, so it's really popular, and as a result of that, we've seen a lot of single sign-on type stuff. Facebook has recently developed a PhoneGap plugin for the last single sign-on. Uh, we're working with Twitter to do the same. Uh, native controls are another one that's really popular for iOS. Uh, we're not really usually in favor of people doing this, but if you do need native controls for a platform and are willing to accept the fact that you are locking into that platform, there's options for you. Okay, inbound, outbound, this is just like quick, we won't go too far on this. Apache license in, MIT, BSD on the web. If you care, all that means is that it's free for you to use commercially. If you want more information, just ask me. It's boring. It's hard, but a lot of cool corporate numbers there. Phone gaps popping. That's what you can get. Um, so, when, you, when you're doing development, it'd be nice if it was just like I could rock with my text editor and things just work. 
they don't, you need tools to help you. Um, and the software developer's toolkit is fairly limited these days in mobile. Uh, it's not as bad as it was when we started this business. Um, Ripple is an emulator that recently got bought by RIM, and it's quite good. It implements a PhoneGap API, and it's a Chrome extension. Um, that helps. Emulation is pretty good, but uh, Jason can attest it, it, when you want to actually ship, you need devices. And so devices are key. Once you have a device, whatever happens on that device, who knows? You're back to alert debugging. It's like 1990 all over again. And Winery is the tool of choice in Nitobi to actually get involved with the browser instance of the it. It's, it's hugely important. We saw what it could do. And we play nice with all the various text editors that are out there. There's a host of tools that you can use uh, once you start writing JavaScript, or more likely you just don't want to write JavaScript, so you look at what tools are available. Um, we fully support them all. Here's a bunch of links. You can download the slides. You can follow them if you don't know how to use Google. Do. So then people always ask me what's in our roadmap. So it's a big question. So tomorrow uh, at 1 o'clock we're going to do phone gap day and we're shipping 1.0. Everyone's like, sweet, 1.0, woo, woo. <laughs> <laughs> but you're all like, what's in 2.0? <laughs> and the answer to that is everything we haven't finished yet. It's not a very good answer. <laughs> um, so that's all I got for you. No, I'm just kidding. That's all I got. Um, 2.0's themes, uh, so 1.0 of the theme was all about device APIs. We, we felt that was an important area to tackle before we started looking at other things. 2.0 is going to get more into the UI. How we get into the UI, I'm not sure. Uh, there are areas of the user interface and user experience of a phone that we feel that we should get involved in, and that doesn't necessarily mean the things that you, you're looking at directly. I'm talking more about things like your notifications area, uh, perhaps background services, this type of thing, WebGL maybe. So there's, there's a, a quick glance. That was really fluffy. You guys want to check out some code, maybe, or do you just want to drink beer? If you guys were nodding really vigorously, and then when I said beer, they were like, <laughs> Maybe not. A little time. A little time? A little time. Okay, well, I'll just go quick. I'll go quick. I promise. Oh, so many jokes Tom's biting back on that one. So, uh, this is build.phonegap.com. And uh, this, is, this is PhoneGap in the cloud. It's actually a pretty fun project just from a web dev perspective because if my browser wants to behave. Oh, I can't reach it because of it. It's responsive. Oh, wait, I can. Hold on. We'll see. So, this alone, this has nothing to do with the functionality, by the way. This is just a tool to me. So, CSS media queries are going to save us all. That's all, that's all I have to say about multiple devices. But the, the layout is responsive. And that, that in itself is kind of nice. I had a revelation the other day that I could build and rebuild native mobile applications through my browser on my fucking phone, which is kind of cool. So you want to create a new app, you're going to click new app, I don't have to walk you through this too much. We'll give it a name, uh, something meaningful, awesome app, perhaps. We've got this little bit here where you can click, it says enable debugging. Uh, this will embed a winery remote script for you. Uh, and you don't have to go through this to do it. Uh, like Patrick was saying, you can go to debug.phonegap.com. We have a hosted version of winery there. Um, and like he said, if you're comfortable sending all your data through our servers, uh, then go ahead and use it. You're thinking, oh my god, maybe he's doing something nefarious with it. Uh, I can assure you that we don't have time. <laughs> and it's almost a bloody miracle that this thing stays up and running, so it's, it's fine. Um, it's pretty simple, it's like a three-step process. You enter in some kind of key that maybe no one could guess, uh, like, not your name. And don't do that, 
And then you would embed this script tag in your application, like on your phone, any phone, uh, any app that you're loading remotely. And then you click this link down here, and it's going to give you a winery instance. Let's see if anyone's named Brian out there. He's debugging right now. Unlikely, but it could happen. No, no, no devices. We could make that happen, but this isn't actually what I want to show you. So, uh, in PhoneGap build, back to PhoneGap build, just clicking enable debugging is going to give you a debugger, which is really useful. You can have us create a Git repository. Does, uh, who here is using Git? Okay, sweet, so you're a bunch of smug bastards, everybody who isn't using Git. Who isn't using Git? A few people are willing to admit it, that's fine. Um, <laughs> it doesn't actually matter either way. Um, it really doesn't. As long as you're using revision control and it's not made by Microsoft, you're probably okay. So the idea we get is that you can push your code straight to us and we'll automatically build it. This, this creates some interesting potential opportunities. Uh, you could imagine in a continuous integration style system, you commit your code, a callback happens, your code immediately gets deployed and built for six platforms. Your client can download it. You don't have to email or talk to them. That in itself is pretty nice. Uh, we also support SPN, or you can just upload uh, an app. So if I go to PhoneGap's GitHub, there is a repo called PhoneGap Start. And it's kind of our canonical start app uh, that we like to use train people on, on all things phone gap. So I'm just going to steal the URL out of this because I'm kind of lazy. And I'm going to click on pull from an existing repo. And if I have my network connection, Do I have to give it the HTTP or do I get it to get fully shipping as me? That's why. Oh shit. I think I just submitted this like 10 times. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Let's see how many apps I get out of the deal. Yeah. <laughs> We had, we had one of our clients used to do this, but I swear to God, he was like wearing out his like F5 keys or F12, whatever he used to do refresh. Okay, so that happened a bunch of times. You'll, you'll notice that we're building for all the platforms except for iOS, and this is actually normal. Uh, iOS uh, requires this sort of draconian uh, signing key ceremony. Is it, is, who here is an iOS developer? Right, yeah. So those people know. Uh, ask them how awesome it is that Apple is a dictator <laughs> when you can build code to devices you already fucking own. Um, so we've got debugging enabled. That's cool. Uh, you, can, you can modify all these different settings on this app. Uh, I'm going to go over to signing keys, and I actually have a key set up for iOS. Sweet. Let's update my code. Update it from the repo, sure. We're going to go back. And this is all queued up. Uh, we've dispatched robots off to Amazon's cloud. Uh, they have provisioned servers. The servers are now chugging away and trying to build this app. If it all works right, which you know, there's a good chance that it will, we've already got WebOS and Symbian built. Uh, and that's kind of interesting unto itself. So WebOS and Symbian are, are web-based platforms. And so our job is really easy there. The other platforms require compilation. Uh, in some cases, in BlackBerry's case, we actually have to send our code off to their servers to do more things. It's how they work, it's not our deal. Um, so by now, there we go. They built for iPhone. So I brought this awesome document camera and I was going to show the whole process uh, the whole the real device. How many times do you remember? I'm quite <laughs>
Yes, these emasculating bags are crazy. <laughs> my, my girlfriend, she's like, I used to just, I've got like, I've got a lot of shit in my bag, right? And so I used to just like hunt around for what I was looking for in the bag and then I'd like pull out this rat's nest of cables and shake phones out of it. And that wasn't necessarily working so well. So Joni, Joni gave me these bags and now everybody makes fun of me. I'd like to give them to you. You lent them to me? Okay. <laughs> see, see. Uh, all right, this won't take too long, I promise. So the phone gap started out, went out to the cloud, came back, ended up on our servers in binary form. Uh, when I go to grab it, all I got to do is download it. I get an IPA file, which I love, by the way. <laughs> Mission for you to pay a little bit, doesn't it? I would love that. Oh, look at this. What are you doing, Uncle? It's bullshit. <laughs> ah, yeah, same in progress. Everyone's favorite screen. So I got this IPA file, and I already had one. We'll replace with it. It ends up in iTunes. And then I do think I may have to sync it again, possibly. Okay, it has it. And we can just show. I mean, you know. Oh, yeah, thanks, man. All right, maybe. That looks just terrible. <laughs> Yes, but that's not doing any good. Fucking random display. Oh, there we go. Wait. Oh. Well. <laughs> My provisioning profile. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what it's like to be an iPhone developer. <laughs> I don't even have to install the SDK to have that experience. <laughs>
Bluetooth is interesting four years ago. Not, not as interesting today. Uh, NFC actually isn't much better uh, when it comes to like distance, but yeah. There's been talk of it, but there actually hasn't been enough demand for us to just go ahead and do it. There are plugins in the wild, so if you want, I can uh, point you at how to find them. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm going to get it. Yep. Okay, thanks.